Okay, welcome, welcome everybody to like session 15 or 16 or some shit like that of the um, Back to the Cell study course. Um, this this course is, uh, for those of you um, watching on YouTube, this course is um, designed for our um, uh, recruit audience with the idea, at least initially, to uh, walk through the Getty manuscript, uh, which forms the basis of our uh, curriculum in um, at EMMA, and to walk through it, um, not only to get a chance to read it again, of course, but also to take some time to actually look at the manuscript and see things that we will often miss uh, if we're just experiencing fury on the cell floor. Because, of course, there's quite a bit of distance between the manuscript and what we end up teaching and training on the cell floor. There's a lot of work involved between the two. And so um, we're doing this course principally to get a chance to uh, look at it. Um, I, uh, myself, Aaron, am leading this course. Uh, so you're going to get um, principally my view on what we're reading. But um, like I try to say every week, um, my view is but one of many. And like the other teachers at Emma, we don't want you to believe something is so just because we said it. We want you to be convinced by the same evidence that we're convinced by. Um, so um, with uh, that note, today we have finished the posters. Oh, well, well, broadly speaking, we're still on the sword and two hand section of the Getty. Uh, we finished uh, the poster section um, after several weeks, um, and we took our, um, our our time doing it, and that was fantastic. We gave it a good, solid treatment, and now we're on to um, the next bit, which today is going to be the cuts. Uh, so the little introductory preface, and then we're going to get into uh, Joker Largo. Um, like I always try and say every week as well, uh, please do ask questions whenever you have them. Chances are if you have a question, um, a bunch of other people have it too. So anytime you have questions, um, and uh, please do ask. There is no dumb question. Um, they're all uh, great. And just to start off, do we have anybody here who has a question that came from previous sessions that they want to ask before we start. No? Okay, great. All right. So, 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 so. All right. So let's just get right into it. So um, I'm here looking at the two-handed sword section uh, again, at least, of course, as I have kind of a uh, categorized it in my own little uh, wiki project here oh uh, speaking of which a couple people i think asked me for access if you are one of those people please remind me again ping me on facebook or something because i probably forgot who you were um and i apologize for not getting you access already um anyway yeah so um as i uh personally have categorized this section of the sword in two hands and uh, the getty uh, I have it in a bunch of different subject categories. First, the guards, then the cuts, then a little prefatory paragraph. Then we have Jacques Largo, Stretto, and then a final Boar's Tooth Master. So today we're going to be looking at the cuts, um, the preface, and getting into Largo, finally. Uh, so let's, um, yeah, and, and we just finished looking at the posters. And just as a quick reminder, the, the guard section, which begins the um, uh, sword in two hands, it starts off with a explanatory paragraph with a bunch of footwork and some other commentary in it, as well as pictures of um, a posta la donna, both refused and not refused. And then it has six postas which are dissimilar from one another. And then it has a series of 12 posta which are um, designated as at least separate from the first six, not only by the text, but also by the image insofar as all of this set of 12 has a label of a name as well as uh, the designation of pulsativa, stabile, or instabile, okay? which the, other, uh, the first six posta do not have. All right. So that's what we've taken some time to look at. Um, and now we're at the cuts. So this is what comes next. Okay. 
Um, we should also um, let's this take it. This is a good opportunity just to kind of uh, remind ourselves that this format isn't super um, new to us. In the dagger section, the section begins with um, three important pages, three important contextual pages: the page of posta, the page, uh, the senio page, and the page of the four masters. So in a sense, this is kind of what the sword and two-hand section has done as well, um, insofar as it's begun with the posta and then followed with the cuts. Now, the attacks here are shown in the senio page. The cuts in the sword and two-hand section are going to be shown explicitly and individually, though at the end of this section, there will be a senio page, which, we're, you know, which we will look at. It's not sort of formally part of the section uh, per se. Uh, or at least not in my estimation, but anyways. So in the in the dagger section, we start with the po the posta, then we have the senyo page, which shows us the attacks, and it also includes some prefatory comments and contextual stuff as well, which is interesting. And then this third page, which, you know, kind of is unique to the dagger, in that this third page is really, you know, top-down context uh, conceptual, right? It's not only are, do we have posters, and not only do we have the attacks of the dagger, but here are the concepts, the things that we're going to be doing. Disarms, uh, breaks, keys, and throws. And then all throughout the dagger section, we're going to see these techniques put in play through the posters against the attacks, in response to the attacks. Um, the sword and two-hand section isn't really like this. Um, or at least it doesn't get into the concepts. All right, we start with the guards and we have the cuts. Okay, fine. And then we just kind of get into the plays. So it's going to be up to us to um, extract the concepts, as it often is in, in Fury. Um, but in a, in a way that's a little less explicit than the dagger section, um, the concepts that we're going to be looking at and that I'm going to ex uh, sort of extract for you, or at least give an argument, uh, for them anyway. These are things that we'd have to pull out of of the section, rather than being told them explicitly, and then seeing them in front of our eyes. So that's that's a kind of an interesting little difference um, between the dagger section and the sword section. It's also one of the reasons why uh, I uh, I say that the sword section I think is less well organized, or at least it's not as um. Maybe, maybe this is a better way of putting it. It's not as friendly to a dumb modern audience. <laughs> the, the dagger section is pretty friendly, um, but the sword section is less so. So anyways, without further ado, let's just actually get into it. So um, we're here at the cuts now, right? Let's get rid of this. So we've done the posta. Now we're at the cuts, starting at folio 23RA, looking at the colpi fendenti. And you see they have this little red... Uh, designation uh, label as well, which is really interesting. Okay, so um, let me just pull up Discord here. All right. So Alex, would you like to read the first text for us? We are the cuts named Fendenti. In this art, our trade is to part the opponent's teeth and travel down to the knee for good measure. We can easily transition from guard to another, although any guard that becomes low. We also craftily break the opponent's guards while our strikes leave their mark in blood. We fendenti are not slow to strike, and we reopen and we recover and guard with each step. While our strikes leave their mark in blood. <laughs> oh shit, it's pretty hardcore. All right, um, we fendenti are not are not slow to strike, and we recover and guard with each step. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Alex. Okay, so there's actually a lot, um, a lot here, um, as uh, is uh, often. Now we are going to be. Um, it's fortunate that we have this text of the cuts, because there is a lot about cutting, which isn't obvious to us uh, modern people, and um, it's nice to have additional commentary on it um, in a way that we would we would miss this uh, if if it wasn't here. We'd have to extract this. Like like other things from the uh, from the plays, so um, starting with Fendenti cuts. So the first thing to note is that the angle here is the angle of this picture matches the text, 
And I want to compare this to the Senyo page um, because we're going to, um, well, the, the Senyo page, which follows the sword section, is the most famous Senyo picture here right and um we're gonna well, when we do a session we'll probably do one full session on the senyo because it's actually really uh, crazy important and really useful not only as a teaching tool but also to kind of summarize what we're all about and what we're talking about and it's also the kind of the halfway point of the book so it's kind of a big deal but with respect to the angles of the cuts though this senyo page in the getty depicts all the cuts in so far as there are seven six cuts and a thrust the angle, is, the angles are wrong, and the targets are wrong per se. Okay, the um, the senyo page here is depicting cuts, both fendenti and sotani, which are what the cuts from below are, are called. They're depicting cuts at a, uh, a a more a shallower angle, a more flatter angle than the fendenti shown and spoken of here. This angle is from teeth to knees, okay? And when we look at the sotani, we're going to discover that they're, they're the same angle, so from knees to teeth. And this is the, you know, not, it's, it's technically incorrect to say that this is the path that they travel. It's more accurate to say that the target of the fendenti is going to be on this line. Okay, and I want to take a second to talk about this a bit. Um, so let's pull up Posta Longa. Posta Longa. All right, great. So I'm going to say something, and I'm going to say this is the answer, and then I'm, I'm going to... Um, uh, complicate our view okay so the answer is um all cuts end at post along in one of the four hand positions full stop don't ask questions <laughs> that's our answer in the recruit program okay and we we want that to be you we want that to be your initial sort of piece of dogma we want that to be your initial belief for a very specific reason and this is because it's very tempting to have this not the case and the good idea fairy really fucks with post alonga right and there's lots of evidence that we have in our lives that actively fights against us here specifically everything we've ever seen about swords everything we've ever seen about swords people using swords 99.9 .9 percent of it is people not finishing their cuts at post longa it's people finishing their cuts in frontale or all the way behind them or finishing their cuts in full iron gate or crazy stuff like that and we don't want you we want you to to, to disbelieve this we want you to just throw this out that the only cut, the only cuts there are, regardless of where they come from, finish and post along a full stop in one of the forehand positions, prime, second, third, or fourth. Okay. And so when we look at the cuts here, our intuitive interpretation of these cuts is that the cut itself travels on this angle from knees to teeth or teeth to knees but that's not the case or rather that is an excessively simplistic view because what a cut is strictly speaking is the act of bringing the sword from oh, where's my where's my pointer aha the act of bringing the, bringing the sword, let's say the hands are resting in post alonga, right? And the sword tip is here, okay? The cut is this movement here where the, the target is aimed to be hit in post alonga. That's the cut, nothing else, right? Strictly speaking, right? So if you wanted to hit a target, you wouldn't be trying to hit the target at your toe. 
right? You wouldn't you wouldn't be trying to. Can I undo with this thing? Da, 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 where's my undo button? Don't make me erase. Oh, you bastard. All right. You know, conventionally, we don't make cuts that are short, right? Where the cut drops from a poster that's high and drops low without coming to its full extension or the reverse, right? Where, it, where the cut starts low and comes up high without coming to its full extension. The standard, our standard practice that we want to instill in people is to make every cut at their full extension ending in post along or rather attempting to strike the target at post along and then once this is everyone's habit right then the more and more advanced you get the more you're going to see opportunities to fudge this a bit because of course there are times when you are going to tactically want to make us make a crooked cut make a small cut make a you know reduced size cut maybe you have to make a crazy parry and you have to just do something you know the situation is such that you just have to you have to do something unconventional to save yourself and that's fine right that's fine but we don't want to start off with all that chaos right that is tactical that's a tactical chaos that you're going to engage in with reason once you get to uh, to have a certain level of practice in swordsmanship, right? Our normal sort of default, and I would say the thing that we tr tend to try and and focus on, right? You don't necessarily want to have a fight where your kind your cuts are varied and crazy complex. You'd rather have a fight where you're fighting your your typical normal fight with with the sword as it's meant to be used in the way that it excels, which is um, in Largo at uh, full extension, full natural extension, okay? So uh, again, we're looking at the cuts here, the Colpi Fendenti, the target of, of the Fendenti can be anywhere, teeth to knees, where the end of the cut is that full expression at post longer. okay? Lastly, and this, all, all of what I'm saying is kind of, we're talking about cutting mechanics here. Uh, and lastly, though it's true that a cut will finish at post longa, that doesn't mean that it has to stop at post longa. So you could have a motion where you cut high, hit the target, and continue low. But it's important to understand that the transition to the low posta is a, just that. It's a transition. It's not part of the cut. The cut is this expression of energy to post longa and the rest of the movement of the sword, wherever else it goes, is part of the transition uh, that comes after, either to another cut, to another posta, to a, or to a parry, or whatever. Okay? So, yeah, the Fendenti. It looks, like, it looks pretty simple, but there's some really important concepts there to be clear about. Um, and, and to practice, right? Um, these, these, th these sort of things aren't obvious, and they take practice to... Um, make habit right you don't want to have to think about this stuff uh, you want them to just be just be habit okay um so uh, in this art our trade is to part the opponent's teeth and to reach all the way down to the knee um notice the fendenti goes all the way down to the knee right um there's a great gift somewhere of aldo um giving me a fendente to my balls and dropping me like a sack of potatoes um the, <laughs> I didn't know that you could get a to take a fendente to the nuts, but you can, <laughs> and it, it is perfectly within this target range. Uh, Fiore tells us, and uh, I, I I definitely learned that one day. So so uh, don't be under the impression that fendente can only hit the head, right? Uh, the fendente can can express itself all the way down to the upper thigh, and 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 so too, of course, this uh, this otani. Um, but that's the thing. And we craftily break opponent's guards. Well, we, um, so I'm, I read this as him, as him, uh, uh, kind of, uh, mentioning provocations, uh, um, in an office on way, but I don't want to get too far into that right now. Um, let's just say, uh, the Fendente cuts often cause opponents to, uh, move from their guards. 
let's say that. Um, because Fendenti are scary, right? Uh, and our strikes leave a trail of blood. See, that goes without saying. Fendenti are not slow to strike, and we recover and guard with each step. We're not slow to strike. Um, that's definitely um, <laughs> that's definitely depending on your practice, right? Um, each fencer, uh, if you watch, if you watch all the fencers at Emma, specifically if you're watching them for the speed of their cuts, there's obviously fencers that are f far faster than others, right? All Fendenti are uh, thrown by um, Emma students are not equal. Um, and so when we read this, we Fendenti are not slow to strike. All things being equal, that's correct. Strikes from below or strikes from above are, you know, just as fast as any other strike, right? And if they're done with proper mechanics and whatnot. Um, but don't um, mistake this to him, uh, Fiore, meaning that they're all quick, right? Because they're not. Some some people are rel are um, ponderous in their blows, right? And some people are excessively fast, excessively quick. Okay, um, but that's just part of striking mechanics in your footwork, principally. And lastly, he says recover and guard with each step. Um, you know, this seems like a little small thing. Those of us who really like to um, marry hand motions with feet motions, and I'm, I'm one of them, uh, really love this little bit because we think it's indicative of uh, that Fury might agree um, that uh, hand hand motions ought to be um, ought to be uh, paired with foot motions. Though, of course, this could also mean just, you know, finish your blows in guard, right? You don't want to have a Fendenti that drifts off into Never Never Land, right? We already kind of know this about Fiore. Fiore, like I've said many times, if I had to reduce the whole system down to one phrase, from posta, through posta, to posta. So there is no posta outside of guard. So necessarily, if you're cutting from a guard to posta longa and then transitioning to another guard, you're never not in guard, right? Um, but of course, if you, if you watch um, the wider world of swordsmanship, you see lots of uh, times when people are cut fendenti and don't up don't end up in guard. And if you want a great place to check this out circumstantially, try and look up cutting competitions. There's tons of examples of people who, for whatever reason, when they're fencing, they're cutting properly, but as soon as they get a sharp sword in their hand, their 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 cuts are ending in all sorts of janky places. Which is really bizarre uh, to me personally, but um, but but watching watching cutting competitions uh, from a variety of sources is another interesting way to study the nature of the cuts, right? And you know we're human beings, right? There aren't really any, you know, there are some unique and inventive cuts, but the fendente sotanis and and mezzanis are the pretty standard for human beings. And uh, regardless of what sword art you're looking at, you're going to see fendente sotani mezzanis and, and thrusts. So. Um, there's, uh, there's lots of evidence out there on YouTube to, to see. Um, yeah. All right. With Fendenti. Moving on to the Sotani, their, um, brothers or sisters. Kulpi Sotani. There's the image, folio 23RB. Uh, Andrew, would you like to read this one? We are the cuts called Sotani who travel the same path as the Fendenti, only going from the knee to the middle of the forehead. Then we can either return through the same path or remain in post -alunga. Okay, so everything that I said about the Sotani, uh, excuse me, about the Fendenti, I would say about the Sotani, um, at least with all, as all the principles are concerned, they come at the same angle, so from, um, from knees to teeth. Uh, notably... Uh, well, anyway, yeah, from knees to teeth. I don't want to really, you know, get too much into the ankle biting nonsense. There's, there's no, there's no mention in Fiore of attacking targets lower than the knee, except for one place that I'm aware of, and that's in the, in the Largo section. And we'll, we, we'll see it next week, not this week. But there is one mention in Fury of him attacking someplace lower than the knees, but it's in an, except, an exceptionally odd circumstance. Broadly speaking, um, Fury doesn't talk about it, nor does he ever show it, and it's um, you—it's probably safe uh, for Fury to conclude that it's uh, 
it's not something that he favors, not least because um, the there's a very practical reason for not attacking below the knee. Um, and that is that the weaknesses of attacking to the thigh, which is part of the leg, the weaknesses that you have here are I increased many fold if you attack this low. Um, we're going to get to, we'll talk more about this when we get to one uh, the Largo play where we attack, he attacks the leg. But there are significant risks with attacking the leg. And um, that's attacking the leg from knee to, to, to crotch, right, the, the thigh. Attacking lower than that is very, very dangerous. And Fiore tends to, uh, he, he doesn't really doesn't really advocate that. So this, the targets, again, of the Sotani, anywhere from knees to teeth, um, along the same lines as the, as the Fendenti, um, to the middle of the forehead. And then we can either return along the same path, which makes sense, or remain in post longer. So the only other thing I want to say here is um, that there is an open discussion. I will uh, say, yeah, that's the right word. There's an open discussion within Emma about the prominence of cuts with either the true edge or false edge from below. Okay. So let's remember that um, with when we hold the sword, the true edge is the edge that um, faces our knuckles or faces the enemy, and the false edge is the edge that faces us, right? The true edge and the false edge, okay? They have important properties, right? The true edge is able to resist force very well, and it's also able to exclude lines very well. The false edge um, tends to be quicker to get to a target but it does not resist force anywhere near as well because of the bone structure of our body. And it tends to not exclude lines uh, very well. Okay. Um, so with the Sotani, um, from, with attacks from below, we have, first of all, already seen an example of a true edge below from below. Um, so let's refresh that in our minds. So when we began this, the sword, we began with the sword in one hand. We began with uh, a tail on the right, on the on the left, and the response that we gave against cuts, thrusts, and um, thrown attacks, at least when they're coming to our right side, is a true edge a sotani. That's often going to end up finishing in prime, postalonga in prime. Even though this kind of looks more like Finestra, this is after uh, an entry is is made, of course, as we as we talked about. Um, if the if the cuts are coming in from the left, this is going to end up being in some sort of uh, uh, frontale or breve uh, position in second. But the point is, we've already seen true edge sotanis here. Okay, um, we have also already seen false edge sotanis. At least we've seen them mentioned. And um, that is in the posta section. Excuse me. The posta section when we looked at Dente di Cingaro and uh, his brother, uh, Middle Dente di Cingaro. So in this text, if you remember, we talked about giving attacks from below, upwards like a boar, and then coming back down on the arms with a fendente can deliver a thrust to the opponent's face and then coming back down. Um, conventional interpretation of this paragraph and what he's trying to describe here is that these attacks are coming up with the false edge and then coming back down with the true edge if they come back down, right? Um, as opposed to in the sorted one, one hand section when we saw that parry and repost, right? Um, and I, I don't want to belabor the point, but uh, in the sword in uh, one hand section, we saw that parry and repost play that I made a big deal about. This is n not done with the false edge, at least uh, as far as far as it matches with this play. It's not done with the false edge. He's made the, the, the defense with the true edge and then turned his sword over and made a second attack with the true edge. Now, of course, could he have done it with the false edge? Yeah, sure, probably, right? But my point is, is that we've seen both, right? From below, 
from the, these Sotani blows, we've seen the usage both of the true edge and the false. So why am I mentioning this? I'm mentioning this because there is a conversation within Emma right now as to which cuts should be primary, if any, from the Sotani, uh, from low guards as Sotani blows. And I'm not going to give an answer to this question, but I want everybody to uh, know that there is a question about it. Um, some people believe that the true edge Sotanis are extremely circumstantial and that their usage is, um, that their usage is not conventional. Um, whereas they believe those same people will, will say that from low guards, the use of the false edge is um, primary and um, not and, and not the true edge. There are other people who believe that the use of either true or false from low guards or anywhere else um, is entirely tactical and depending on the situation and that there's no primary or secondary, you know, uh, positions, but it's good that everybody knows that this conversation is going on. Okay. And it is interesting, but here we go. Pendente, Sotani, same lines coming from uh, below and coming from above. Okay. Any questions about either of those two things so far? No. Okie dokie. Great. On to the next one, the Mezzani blows. Okie dokie. Folio 23RC. Uh, Beatty, would you like to read us this one? We are the Mezzani, middle cuts, so named because our path is between the Fendente and the Satani. From the Mandrito side, we use the true edge, and from the Reverso side, the false edge. Our path can be anywhere between the knee and the head. All right. Thank you very much, Beatty. So, um, not much to add other than what's in the text. Our, you know, they're the middle cuts. Um, they're um, they're delivered horizontally, broadly speaking, regardless of whether or not their their target is um, truly horizontal to our arms. Right? Fiore says that the the target, uh, and there's more evidence, I think, for reading these lines as indicating targeting rather than actual the path of the cut. But anyway, the target can be either uh, from the head to the, the leg. So actually, the most common um, cuts to the leg um, are fendentes and mezzanos. And um, especially with the um, uh, the sword uh, systems that have an offhand weapon, like a buckler or a shield, um, the mezzani to the leg are very common, are very common. Um, often with a an action which appears to uh, which appears like it's going to result in a fendente, like transitioning to a finestra or long and prime, you think a fendente is going to come. The defensive tools rise up, expose the leg, and then a mezzani, uh, a low mezzani to the thigh gets gets popped. Um, many a rib and upper thigh have been bruised um, because of that. And uh, Kel's actually fantastic at those. Is he here? Oh shit, he is there. Yeah. There, there you go. Well, didn't mean to praise you in, uh, in front of you, Kel, but uh, yeah, those are Kel likes those. Um, all right, yeah. So true edge and false edge. Oh yes, the last thing is this. So the formal curricular answer about throwing mezzanos with the sword in two hands is that when we throw mezzanos. From the right side, we throw them with the true edge forward, and from the left side, we throw them with the false edge forward. We do this because Fiore says so. Why do we think he says so? Well, the fendente, or the mentidos from the false edge side, thrown with the false edge. Sorry, I just mixed up mixed up my terms. The mandritos from the left side, thrown with the false edge forward, seem at first to be counterintuitive, but the standard answer is that if you throw the mandrito from the left side with the true edge forward, your hands lead the cut for a significant period without being actually behind your sword, and they're liable to be hit. And so when you throw as, uh, the mandrito from the left with the false edge, the tip of the sword leads the cut almost the whole time if you throw it properly and therefore your um 
your uh, your threats are ahead of your targets. You're moving in true time, and um, it reduces the likelihood that your hands are going to be um, are going to be sniped or sniped at. Right. So um, that's that's the, the the formal answer. Um, certainly, when you're throwing a, uh, a mendrito, uh, when you're not engaged, when you're already in an engagement, when the swords are already touching, this um, becomes more complicated. Okay, so um, I don't, I wouldn't read this as a, as a, you know, a papal declaration that you'll always throw met, uh, a mezzani from the left false edge, regardless of the circumstances. Um, that's it's a little more complicated than that, but certainly if you're throwing them as a as an opening blow, when you're not engaged, when you actually have space to throw, from the left side he says he wants you throwing them false edge, and from the right side, true edge. Okay. And last but not least, the thrusts, the punta. All right, uh, Bruce, would you like to read this text for us? We are the thrusts, cruel and lethal. Our path is through the center of the body, starting from the crotch all the way up to the forehead. We thrusts are divided into five types. Two high thrusts, one from each side. Two low thrusts, also one on each side. And a middle one delivered from the mezza porta di ferro, posta longa or posta breve. All right, thank you, Bruce. All right, so, um, yeah. Thrusts and cuts are mentioned in the same breath, right? Um, you know, they're they're part of your uh, Largo tools. Fiora mentions that there are five kinds of thrusts, or five five types of thrusts. Um, I think I'm aware of a couple different ways people read this. Um, one way to read this, and it's definitely the way that I, I read it, is him describing thrusts in different hand positions. So two high thrusts, one on each side, I would um, think of as a prime and a high fourth. Two low thrusts, one on each side, would be a low fourth and a second position, and then a middle one in third position. So that's how that's how I'd read it. He may or may not have meant that. He may have had something more specific in mind. Um, if he did, uh, if he did, did if he if he did if he does, <laughs> I, I'm not exactly sure what more specific. Uh, things he would be uh, referring to, maybe, maybe we'll we'll be able to speculate on that as we move through the uh, move, move through Largo. But um, this this interpretation, the the one that I gave you, uh, is not uh, is not crazy, right? This isn't going to throw you uh, um, confuse you. So you know there are different types of thrust. That's true insofar as there are different hand positions, but just like with the cuts. All of all thrusts, at least this is what we want you to believe at first. Finish at posa longa. So um, yes, there are fendente, sotani, mezzani, and thrusts, and the thrusts have five types, but they all end here in one of four hand positions: first, second, third, fourth. Okay, and this is what um, this is not only what we're going to be using to, uh, uh, to to strike our enemy with, but it's also principally what we're going to be using to organize our uh, the expression of our defenses. Right, with the caveat, of course, that sometimes in some uh, cases you have to break this this uh, rule. Right, you do have to make defenses that aren't don't end in post longa, um, and and things like that. Okay, um, does anybody have any questions about the cuts? And the thrusts. I, I don't really want to get too much in, uh, more into mechanics because I feel like it'd be a waste of time. You know, um, moving true time, uh, moving hand, body, foot, having your hands uh, proportionate, your hand motions proportionate to your foot motions and vice versa. Um, you know, all that. There's, there's a whole bunch of different uh, basic habits that we need to be ingrained in us in order to do these well and at speed 
um, but we can't really do anything about them here. <laughs> you know, there's no point in harping on them or anything. So, um, so yeah. So with the conclusion of the cuts, we now have more or less all of the tools we need to get into the plays, right? We have all of the posters, we have the cuts, um, which are going to, sh you know, the cuts show our motions between the posters, right? Not only from the poster expressing the sword into our enemy, but also um, expressing the sword from a poster through a cut to a defense and then back to another poster and so on. So we got our old basic tools here. So we're kind of ready to start the start the plays. So let's um let's get into it. I'm gonna leave post longer here. Do I need these? Yeah, I'll leave this segment here too. Okay. So um the preface to the whole sword section. Let's get into it. Twenty five R A B. Uh, Graham, would you like to read this one? Sure. Uh, I am the sword, and I am lethal against any weapon. The spear, the axe, and the dagger are all worthless against me. I can become extended or withdrawn. When I get near the opponent, I can enter into close play, perform disarms, and abrazare. My art is to perform breaks and binds. I am expert in parries and strikes, and I always strive to finish with those. Come against me and feel pain. I am royal. Enforce justice. Propagate goodness and destroy evil. Look at me as a cross, and I will give you fame and a name in the art of arms. Hmm. Thank you, Graham. Wow, lots of lots of words there. All right, so this is the preface that starts the Largo and Strato sections. Um, there's lots of interesting historical things here um, that we should we could probably uh, speculate on at a, at a later date, but I don't want to belabor it. Um, there's just a couple of things here that I want to look at. First of all, I am sword and I am lethal against any weapon. Lances, axes, and the dagger are worthless against me. Well... That doesn't really jive. <laughs> it's not obvious that this is true on the face. First of all, um, he made a big deal about the dagger being, you know, the one weapon that can put a quick end to cruel combat, right? And in the close play, dagger is, dagger is greatest. So we already know that dagger is a consummate uh, problem and a very, very dangerous weapon. The axe, uh, you know, hey, Kel, would you rather have an axe or a sword in armor? An axe. An axe, right? Um, I don't th just think that's Kel's preference. A pole axes are pretty scary uh, weapons. Pretty damn, pretty damn scary. Uh, it's not obvious that a sword is um, better than an axe, you know, by nature, by design. Um, and certainly lances. Well, you know, maybe, maybe there's some there's some utility against the lance on foot, but certainly on horseback. Um, I would be, uh, you know, the lance has you at a significant disadvantage uh, in certain the circumstances. Horseback? Certain, yeah, like, well, like in the charge, right? Like, you can't even, you can, you're not even going to touch the guy with your sword. The guy could poke you with his lance on the charge, and what are you going to do if you had a sword? Oh, right? okay. You, you're, you are, I mis, misheard that. Oh, I sorry. thought you said that the lance was useless on the, on horseback. No, the, the yeah, the opposite. Weapon. That's right. Okay, good. Yeah, that's right. So, so, um. So I am the sword and I am lethal against any weapon. Lances, axes, and daggers are worthless against me. So if this isn't true on the strict face of it, then what might this mean, right? Um, I read this as consistent with the approach that Fiore takes to describing the sword and also the attitude of the fighter in the book. So, you know, Fiore says, has said this with, you know, he's going to say this with all these tools, that they're great. But, you know, the sword can be lethal against the lance, the axe, the dagger. The sword can respond. I think that's the most important takeaway. Right? It's, it's not that these are worthless against the sword, strictly speaking. It's that if you have the sword and use it well, you can respond to a lance. You can respond to an axe and a dagger. Right? Especially when wielded by a numpty. Right, ex exactly, right? Especially given the context of the, of, the, of the fight that you're in, which is completely varied, right? You don't know. The sword can become extended or withdrawn? Absolutely, right? When I get near the opponent, I can enter into close play, perform distance, and observe. So the sword, as a weapon system, not only is the longest weapon that we've seen yet, 
right? The sword in two hands. But it also can perform adequately in close play, right? So, so far, all of our Abrazara and indeed, you know, our dagger is still active, right? There's nothing preventing you from holding a dagger if you have a sword. So this is all kind of built up on, on itself, right? And we're still... Um, we're still reading Fury in a, in a context where the what we've said before is building on what we're reading now. Okay, so we haven't left that. My art is to turn and to bind. I'm expert in offense and offense, and always start to finish in those. Okay, so that's you know that's all I kind of want to take from that. Um, it's not that we didn't necessarily know this that the sword can respond to these weapons, but it's good for Fury to remind us right before we get into the plays. Okay. Um, also keeping note that the the sword is the principal subject for the next long while, right? The sword in two hands is going to have two sections, Largo Strato, both of which are fairly lengthy, and then we're going to get into sword and armor and have a, a bunch more plays. So we're going to be looking at the sword a, a lot. Six more plays. Six more. Is only six in the sword and armor section? Huh. Well, I guess plus the post is there. Uh, yeah. All right. So, last uh, at last we get to uh, Largo and Strato. All right. So let's um, pull back a bit and let's look at let's look at Largo and Strato. Uh, well, let's look at Largo. Uh, let's leave Strato for Strato. So um, we finally arrived to the plays of the sword in two hands, beginning with the first section, the Gioco uh, Strato. Sorry, this, the Gioco Largo section, okay? Um, we defined Largo and Stretto before, but I'll define it again. Um, with the preface that um, there are lots of fun scholarly debates about the definition of Largo and Stretto. Um, <laughs> some, some opinions are more conventional than others, obviously. Um, uh, yeah. So, so this is a this is a really interesting scholarly topic, and there's lots of evidence uh, uh, with which to, um, to, uh, to to study this. The conventional definitions of Largo Strato, or rather, let me say it a different way: the easy definition to hold um, un um, controversially uh, of Largo and Strato is this: that Largo play, the Largo section, involves wide, loose, unconstrained play with the sword at a distance in space and tempo where the sword um, acts uh, at its length and uses its blade in a manner that it's suited to. Okay, Loose, wide, unconstrained play. Okay, Swordsmanship at the blade. With distance between the fighters, that's, you know, uh, I think all of the definitions of Largo, regardless of what specific uh, tack they take, more or less incorporate that concept. Okay, so it, the intuitive, your intuitive grasp of Largo is 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 going to be more or less uh, useful here, right? And uh, and uh, just to cap it off, Strato is going to be the opposite. So Strato is going to be um, close. Um, constrained play where uh, the where predominantly uh, there is abrazari and use of entries and grapples and throws where the sword uh, though it may be employed doesn't function um, specifically at the blade but more with its structure involving uh, pommel strikes manipulations of the limbs, um, you, know, uh, you know, these sorts of like ransom-esque actions, um, all sorts of stuff like that, right? But that's the kind of flavor of thing that Fiori is tr uh, talking about in Stretto, whereas in Largo, it's, it's the more loose, unconstrained actions, okay? And that's what we're starting with, with Jogo Largo. So um, in the Largo section, there are what? 1, 2, 3, 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, 20 plays, plus a conclusion. Okay. Um, 
I personally like to view the section in the following manner. The, I like to cut it more or less in two, where the first half of the section deals with cuts, and the last half, or the second part of the uh, section deals with thrusts, starting at with folio 26 VA. In the section that deals with cuts, um, the first part of it deals with cuts that come from the tip, an engagement with the tip of the sword, and the rest of it um, probably involves actions uh, following from an engagement at the middle of the sword. Um, leaving out actions following from an engagement at the strong of the sword, which is going to be um, more characteristic of Stretto. Okay? So um, I think that's broadly speaking what we're in store for in this section. We're going to be looking at actions coming from an engagement at the tips, then the middle, and then looking at, um, starting with folio 26 VA, looking at thrusts and things that can happen uh, against and around thrusts. Okay? And there you've more or less got the flavor of the of the section. So insofar as that's concerned, pretty conventional topics, right? Nothing super crazy uh, there. All right. But um, yeah, so let's um, let's get into it. Yeah, let's just get into it. So 25RC, folio 25RC, the first master of the Largo section. Um, who's next? Um, uh, Akel, you want me to skip you? Yes, please. Okay. Um, Mark. Here begins the play of two-handed sword in wide play. His master has crossed his sword at the point with his opponent. He says, when I am crossed at the points, I quickly turn my sword and strike the opponent on the other side, the fendente to the head and arms, where I thrust to his face, as you will see next. All right. Thank you, Mark. Okay, so... Um, so this is the first play of, um, of Largo and uh, I'm going to outline a framework for under, for, um, one way to understand these plays in the, in the, in Largo and Stretto, and I'm going to justify it with an argument and obviously you can accept or reject it, but, um, this framework I think is important and it's in response to Oh, you need a, a sort of framework to understand these these sorts of plays in, in fighting manuscripts. You need it because there's a problem. And this is this is a problem that's particular to swordsmanship, or rather particularly obvious in swordsmanship. And I want to address it by going back to Dagger. So Why does this make sense? Oh no, let's do a different one. Let's do this this one. Okay. We didn't really have a problem with this play when we when we looked at it. This is the middle key, right? Play the the the, the play that Fiore talks about incessantly. Um, against a an, an, a a Mandrito dagger attack. We didn't really have a problem understanding this play, and critically understanding the tempo context of this play, right? We didn't have a problem with it because the tempo context of this play was rather obvious. And that is that the dagger man is attempting to murder the, uh, uh, the scholar. When he steps in with his attack, the scholar presents his defense, stops the blow, and then immediately acts. And in this case, the thing that he's acting on, uh, the thing that he's acting to do is to do a middle key. Okay? And it's, it's pretty intuitive to us that if the scholar makes a defense and then does nothing, then he's lost his opportunity for his, his, uh, his middle key or for his follow-on action. Or rather, at least, he hasn't necessarily lost it so much as given his opponent time to do another thing. And we know from our study of the dagger that 
it is critical that the defender doesn't lose this tempo advantage that he gains on the defense because the remedies that the attacker has against his defenses are severe and effective. And this is what puts this unarmed person in the dagger in such a terrible situation because he has to gain the tempo, he has to gain the momentum of the defense and keep it until the opponent is neutralized. As soon as that opponent starts to bring his offhand in and gain the initiative and become the agent again, the defender is very, very, uh, the defender's in massive trouble. Arguably uh, a trouble that he's not going to be able to dig himself out of, right? And the examples of this are many in the dagger section. Um, and they're very, they're very obvious, right? These counters, these counters happen when the tempo accrues to the, def to the attacker. So a defense is made, but the resolution, the remedy to the attack is not, uh, performed in the right time or, or it's performed poorly, right? You know, uh, there's going to be kind of a number of reasons why something might fail here, right? But in this case, the... The scholar made the defense, he stopped himself from dying, but he didn't perform the middle key in the right time, or he didn't have the time to perform the action which he chose, which is in this case the middle key, and the defender was able to act. And, um, and in so acting, not only does he foil the defense, but he kills the defender for his trouble. Okay? So... I want to make it clear that we've already seen this context of tempo and response and counter response before. So it's very important that when we look at plays in swordsmanship, that we take this understanding with us. Because it's important that we remember that the same kind of logic, broadly speaking, is going to be necessary for us to stick to in swordsmanship whenever possible. When we're engaged like this and there's no leader or follower, there's no tempo advantage to either side and anyone can do anything, the situation is exceedingly dangerous for both people, right? But who cares about the other guy? It's exceedingly dangerous for you. So this is why in Largo, in a Largo setting in swordsmanship, you tend to focus on gaining and prosecuting the tempo in an engagement. Now, as a defender, you can gain the tempo with an effective response to an attack, right? So someone attacks you with a fendente or whatever, and if you give an effective response, that response has the ability to not only save you, but steal the tempo advantage to you, accrue it to you, and make you the agent. And then your dictating what the enemy has to do to uh, respond to if he wants to save his life, right? Once that situation ceases, right? Once you're not leading anymore and you don't have an effective uh, action to reverse that situation, that's usually when we leave, right? We want to break the engagement so we get another chance to get that again, right? Rather than linger in an engagement where it could go either way, right? Because we don't want to be in a situation where it can go either way. We only want to be in situations where it's going to go right for us as much as we can, we can wait it that way, right? And this situation combined with the problem that um, the enemy can become suicidal at any time, this creates a situation in Largo where we don't want to persist in the engagement for too long. One, two, three actions at most. Attack, counter, counter contrary, maybe counter contrary, uh, maybe counter, counter contrary and out. Right? Because if it hasn't resolved itself by then, if the engagement hasn't ended up with one of us dying by then, then we're both in big danger. But screw that guy, I'm in big danger. So I got to leave, make my space again, and reset. And this tends to give Largo its character, right? This is the source of this ting, ting, tingy, ting sort of thing that we think about when we think about swordsmanship. Now, of course, if both people are doing this, if both people have this attitude, then you get a very classic kind of fencing match at Largo. If one person doesn't have this attitude or is trying to pressure to stretto or 
or whatever, then you're going to get something that looks a little different. And of course, if both people are looking to press to stretto, then you're going to get stretto, right? But the classic no, logo you're, situation... You're, hmm? you're going to get crash fencing. Well, yes, uh, in, in, indeed, right, indeed. Um, but the classic Largo situation that we're talking about, and of course we begin our analysis always with the, the archetype, right? And then we complicate it afterwards. The Largo that we're in, uh, studying right now is the classic kind of Largo where both people have a care for their own life and um, they're uh, trying to fight at Largo, right? They're trying to use the sword the way it, um, it's uh, most effective, which is at its, at its blade. So why am I going through all this spiel? What's my setup? So Emma has an interpretation for this play, which I have to be careful the way I say this, which isn't obvious from the reading of this play. Okay. But why it's a good way to look at it and why we're going to look at it in, in, in the conventional way that Emma does look at it is precisely because it follows a logic of tempo rather than something else, right? Swordsmanship is, as, you know, martial arts is as much a process of bringing order to chaos as anything else. And we don't want to begin our analysis of something with chaos. So what do I mean? Here we have a picture of two fighters crossed at the tips, the first third of the sword, okay? And let's read again what he said, because I, I blabbed a lot. He begins the play of the two-handed sword, uh, the sword in two hands. This master's cross at the point with his opponent and says, when I'm cross at the point, I quickly... T oh, have we read the text yet? I don't recall. Oh, maybe we didn't read the text yet. Okay, I was just giving a long preface. Now it's time to read the text. <laughs> 20, Folio 25RC, uh, Renat, would you like to read the text for us? Yep. Here begins the play of the sword in two hands in a wide blade. This master has crossed his sword at the point with his opponent and says, when I'm crossed at the, at the point, I quickly turn my sword and strike the opponent on the other side with a pendente that comes down to the head and arms, while I thrust to his face, as you will see next. Thank you, Renat. Okay, great. So, like I was saying, here begins the um, play of the sword in, in, in two hands, the Largo play. He's crossed at the tips. His instructions are this. When I'm crossed at the, uh, at the point, I quickly turn my sword and strike the opponent on the other side with a fendente to the head and arms, or I thrust to his face, as you will see next. If... There is no leader or follower here. Actually, I'll go further. If the scholar, if the master is not the leader here, this play doesn't make sense. This is exceedingly dangerous for them to do. If these guys are paused at the tips, then the first the first actor can choose to act. Yes, that's can choose to be the first the first player. That's true. But because they're cross at the tips, there's a lot of space. There's a lot of distance involved here, and distance equals time. There's a lot of opportunity for the enemy to read and understand what you're doing. And if you just decide to unilaterally act when you're in contact with the enemy and you're not leading, you're not threatening, you're not ahead in tempo, you're um, setting yourself up for a, a double kill at best or um, being um, uh, killed and look like a fool at worst with a, with a repost of some kind. Okay? So just at the first reading, it, uh, because we know how tempo works, we've seen it in the dagger, we've seen it in wrestling, we've seen it everywhere, tempo is still working out here. We sh it would be a mistake, in my argument, the argument I'm giving, which is one of many, it would be a mistake to understand this picture as these two men having crossed at the tips, just having crossed, right? That's that can't be what, how this ended up. So I argue. So how did this end up where it is? How would they get cross at the tips? This is where Emma's interpretation comes into play. Emma's conventional interpretation of the first play of Largo, which I'm sure um, many, if not all of you, have seen many times, is that the enemy gives a cut, conventionally a post of uh, a, a, a fendente, 
to this um, the defender with the intent of hitting them and killing them. And the defender in response has acted in such a way that not only made the defense, but stole the tempo and, ri and risked the other person's life. And the classic example of this is giving a counter fendente to what this enemy gives. So the play, as Emma conventionally shows it, is starts off with a you know a regular attack from the enemy. He wants to kill you. Okay, you're you're lying in a post and maybe you're refused, whatever, showing your shoulder, whatever. He gives you a fendente and you counter with your own fendente. And at the moment of engagement, you will be crossed at the tips if this is done properly. And even though the defender acted after the attacker, he acted in such a way which made a defense that was not only a defense, but an attack. And in Emma's conventional interpretation of this play, if the defender does nothing in response to this engagement, they can die. When their foot would have been down, so this defender, uh, this attacker is, um, is giving this attack with a passing step. So his foot would have been over here. He's making this attack. His foot's in the air. The defender has made a defense to cross him, to threaten hitting him in the head. And if all goes well for the, for the master, as this person's foot would land, so the master's sword would hit him in the head and cleave it in twain. So this interpretation of this play not only explains how we got here, right? And it offers one example of how we might get here, though, of course, responding from Ladon is not the only way. But it explains one way of how we got here, but it also explains Fiori's instruction. Because if this master is successful in doing this, um, this master stroke, this single time remedy, what it means is it, it, it has forced the fencing logic that we want to see into the engagement. That fencing logic is the attacker gave the attack. If he doesn't change up, he will die. So in response to the single time remedy, he turns his edge into the blow to cause a bind where there would have been an oblique. But this act of turning his edge into the sword is instead of his 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 act of hitting the enemy right it's instead of his intention to strike the enemy in the head or the shoulder if he kept that intention the then his blade his his blade alignment would not have changed and the the oblique engagement would have would have happened and he would have he would have been killed so what we have here is we have an example of a defender making a defensive action which forces the attacker to not only abandon his blow but change his intention and that is a super important concept for us to remember because it's not just an active here this is a concept fundamental to us in swordsmanship that we're going to try and replicate in as many places as possible okay? Aaron, sorry, just to confirm and yeah. then when uh he turns his sword to to avoid the oblique mm -hmm. that's when the master can do the cut that is actually they would do this first master here Ah, well, okay. So ex exactly. So, so I'm getting to that. When, when the, when the agent turns his edge in, the agent is the binding one, right? When the agent turns his edge in, he is now following because he is now responding to, to a risk, right? He is responding to a risk while simultaneously abandoning the threat that he was presenting. So once he turns his edge in, by the moment he decides to turn his edge in, he's now following. And so this defender is going to still give the attack, right? When we, when we train this play at Emma, we always say the intention of the defender in, all, in every case is to complete the single time remedy. And based on the, 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 the feeling of this engagement, you're going to decide to do other things so this so this defender he tries a single time remedy it's foiled by the agent turning his edge in so now what does he do and now because he's leading he can do these things because he's leading he can if he has time 
and depending on how on how much that sword edge turned in or how much push the agent gave to prevent the the single time cover he could cut around to the other side with a pendant to the head and arms while he's leading the tempo this makes perfect sense now and is great and if he binds the sword but he doesn't push you across the center line then your sword is effectively still in the center but you're leading the tempo so that also gives it the opportunity to drop your point if it's not already in his face and thrust him in the face so i realized that was a that was a kind of a long journey there all right but i wanted to move from the beginning to the end to give you guys the logic as to why we um, look at this play or one one reason why we look at this play the way we do and not only because there are many other fury schools that do not go through this exercise and they interpret this play as beginning with the 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 swords cross at the tips in third without some pre-context okay and this affects the rest of how they interpret largo so and i say that i mean i'm sounding pejorative obviously i don't think this is a good uh, uh way, way to start but it's important to know that there are other ways of interpreting out there and and not only that but strictly speaking in this text we do not hear talk of um master strokes we do not hear talk of single time remedies we do not hear talk of tempo right so this is these are things that emma is understanding about the nature of swordsmanship and what we what we'd like to think we've learned about swordsmanship and about fighting and what this means about this this is something that emma is bringing to our understanding of this play that isn't laid out for us that isn't spoon fed for us in the text of this play because of course sometimes the critical information isn't spoon fed to you on the right play the play that it belongs right so um but all that is to say that if you were a furious school and you didn't interpret this this way and you just read it strictly based on the text you're not strictly speaking wrong right the text isn't saying that there needs to be tempo here and blah 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 blah, blah. But I hope that the explanation uh, that I've given, the story that I've given as to why we view this play this way, I hope that story makes sense. And I'm going to try and show as we continue on through the plays why that tempo is important to remember, why it explains why we can do something at some, and sometimes and not at others. So um, before we leave this play, just as a quick summary, what's our view? What's going on here with the play? The agent has given a fendente to the um, to the patient the patients responded with a fendente of their own with the intention of hitting the enemy in the head and because of the angles unless the enemy changes their intention and binds the sword they will be struck they will not strike the the, the master and they will be struck in, in themselves in turn and in the act of binding it's going to give us some options as a defender okay does anybody have any questions about that or, uh, yeah, I yep. have one, one quick question, just to clarify mm -hmm. the terminology. So yep. we usually say that there's the to and through. Right. Um, so this, just to be totally sure, the, the text of this play is describing the through part of to and through. And then we are assuming that the to has already occurred, the to being the single time uh, master strike defense. That's, that a great, that's a great question. The text of this play is not describing the through at all. So okay. yeah, so let me let me pull back on that um, because that's that is a very natural uh, a natural question. So I'm getting lost in my tabs here. This is Stretto. I don't want Stretto. I want Largo. Um, okay. So um, again, conventional M interpretation, to my understanding, has there th has there be three options from the first play of Longsword. It has the master stroke cut right the the single time remedy and then it has the thrust on the right side and then it has the turning the sword over to finestra and cutting on the left side okay so those are the three the three options right so mm -hmm. with respect to two and through 
Um, or um, th th two and two and through. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So I guess. Uh, I may be muddying up the definition in my. Yeah. Mind. Yeah. Well, okay. Well. Anyways. Yeah. So. So. <laughs> and again, another another thing that makes this complicated is that, of course, there is some variation as to how we refer to them, right? I think in Amitrano we we used we started to call them A, B, and C for a while, right? One A, one B, one C. So the the principal action, the one that begins this series of events, is the attempt at the single time remedy, okay? And if that's uh, a foiled, because it's possible that it may not be, but if that's foiled, then what will happen is the enemy will bind you. And the binding will lie on one side or the other of the scholar's center line, mm -hmm. right? And the center line, of course, it, it bisects your body, right? And it stretches outward between you and the, and the opponent. If the binding is to your left, to the left of your center line, i.e. if his sword has not pushed into the right side of your center line, then because your swords are in contact, necessarily your right side is rather open and clear. And that allows you to do this play. Or something like this, where you bring the sword down, you insist your 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 advantage on the right side, and you threaten a thrust. If he pushes you from the left into your right side, and he starts to push your sword into that right side of your center line, then necessarily he's leaving your left side and he's pushing the sword over. And this is opening up space here for you. And this is generally when we stick that engagement, let him push you, come up to Finestra and cut around to the other side. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in in that explanation, I th I think I've I've tried I've shown the three things right either the master stroke or because of what he's done either the attack on the right side or the attack on the left side. Does that make sense? Yes. Great. Um, great. And and again, just to beat a dead horse, what makes this all work is the tempo uh, advantage you've gained from the mere attempt at the master stroke, right? I just, I need to stop saying that. I don't know why I have the German in my brain. The mere attempt at the single time remedy, right? Because even if, you know, maybe your targeting was off, you know, maybe, even if maybe you were a little short, if the enemy believes, believed that your, your defense here would cause an oblique and hit them and they bound as a result, then they're now following you. Right. They're now they've right. gone from agent to patient and you now have the opportunity to just like with dagger to do a thing with the time you've built, uh, you, you, you've gained. OK, uh, but that's a great question, Graham. I, I was I was meaning on talking about that and I, I forgot. A anything Thanks. else? Do you have anything to add about this one, Cal? This is kind of a big one. Um, I found your process of explaining it a bit convoluted and just I, fi I find there's a simpler way mm -hmm. and it's Fury's own words uh, when you meet at the tips you cannot stay at all right when you meet in the middle you can stay a little mm -hmm. and when you meet at the strong you can resist mm -hmm. and do what you need mm -hmm. uh, the, the ABC I bet um, I don't recall hearing it put that way but it has certainly been presented that way mm -hmm. The idea that if you meet on the weak, uh, both swords, you turn a cut to the other side because there's no way to control that. Hmm. So as you say, the center line, you know, he's going to push you one way or you're going to push him in another way. That doesn't give you any safety. Hmm. So hmm. leaving a weak bind and crossing to the other side is a way to exclude him from completing the same cut you just tried. It's that like it's it's primary yeah. but we very very rarely see it for the simple reason that we're playing with blunts which don't bind right. uh, mm -hmm. it, the uh, other thing about it is when you start playing with sharps you stay farther apart by mm -hmm. 
simple, simple nature. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people have an invincible warrior mm -hmm. mindset mm -hmm. because they've never seen what a cut from a sharp sword can do. That's a great point. That's a great point. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, you did you you did get to it, but it was kind of going around the round uh, on the roundabout a few times. I like to hear myself uh, talk. You know, it's, it was nice. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm <laughs> sure Carol loves that part. Um, in any case, uh, I think that it's simpler to say that if you meet at the tips, they don't last very long. The meeting doesn't yeah. last. Yeah. And if you meet in the in the middle, where we say. You try to get people to meet in the middle, then the play is going to work one way or the other. And when you meet in the middle, you cannot go to the other side. And that's something right. I see an that's awful right. lot of scholars doing. That's exactly is, right. Yeah. Um, really seriously meeting in the middle and then trying to change all the way around to the other side. And quite frankly, it's it's disastrous. Yeah. And uh, yeah. We we yeah. tried to tried and tried to try to break people of it, but because they've seen the idea of going to the other side, they think it can be done from a bind in the middle. It it just can't. Yeah. In any case, that's a fantastic that, point. I'm uh, with you. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Kel, very much for everything that you said, and I do actually I absolutely want to talk about that a bit uh, now because um we're we're going to go on to talk about this one in a second, but in a way we've already kind of talked about it. Um, this play. So I want to, uh, in order to help us understand more about the nature of this, I want to talk about um, the second master a bit. And I'm going to start by saying, oh, by reemphasizing something that Kel said, which is that, you know, as with, as is often with Fiore, when we're studying the plays, it's not just about what the hell is this play and how do we do it. That's a very short-sighted way to read this stuff. Right. It's also about what are we learning broadly about swordsmanship? What is Fiore showing us? What's behind the mere actions of this play? And as Kel said, behind the mere action of this is a crossing at the tips. So what does that mean? What's the nature of the crossing at the tips? And Kel said it exactly. When you're crossing at the tips, you cannot stay at all. Right. And if this means if swords are, you know, if swords work best when they have space, and crossing at the tips is um, gives the swords the most space to work. Then, when swords are working best, when swords are working the way that they love to work, they cannot stay at all at the tips, right? So this shows you how swordsmanship in Largo is very fluid and changing, and and it's you know it's still very. It's very movement focused, very movement oriented. Um, one of the things about our um, fighting with the sword in two hands uh, that is probably uh, where is Connor here? Oh man, I wish Connor was here. Um, that is probably more of an artifact of our schooling as, as fencers than anything else is the fact that we do bind a, a whole lot and we play at the middle a lot. And um, you know, and with the sword in two hands, there's less largo at the tips than there is with the sword in one hand and it's possible that's due to the nature of the sword in two hands it's possible but it could also just be the way that we we we, we tend to use it right because the sword is in two hands the swords can resist binds very well so we can get away with kind of really bashing but that's not necessarily what we should be aiming for right and anyways all that is to say is that even long swords Swords in two hands, at the tips, they cannot stay at all. That's important to remember. Fluid, um, uh, lots of motion, right? And just like with the sword in one hand, one of the major reasons for that motion is the fact that the furniture on the, the, on the hands is very minimal, right? And you can't afford to be extended with this lack of furniture, Um very long you have to keep your hands moving as soon as they're stationary they're going to be plucked by a sniper or by a quick shot right and especially if a fencer is experienced and they know what they're doing the shots can come from anywhere it can be very quick so again largo play it's about motion it's about um staying not at all okay another thing that kel said is about going to the other side um cutting to the other side is also a classic um, experience that Emma students have when they're doing Largo fencing, 
right? The cut a fendente to the one side, they block it, you move rise up to fenestra and you cut a fendente to the other side. Okay. Um, what Kel said is exactly correct, and that is that that action of coming around to the other side properly belongs to engagements at the tips and not engagements at the middle. And many, many, many times at Emma, when people get caught, they get they get their forearms smashed with fendentes. They get caught because they're rising up to a finestra when they're crossed too low and they don't have the time. They don't have the tempo to do it, right? And um, I pulled out the peasant strike here as an example. The peasants, are, are, as, an, as, a, as a, an exception that proves the rule, okay? Because while I will go on to say that the peasant strike is an example of a play of the, of the master cross at the middle, um, a good interpretation of the peasant strike is not one that receives the blow at the middle, number one. And two, the kind of blow is a peasant blow, right? It's a blow from a dummy dum dum. Oh, I'm gonna cleave you in twain. Well, and you know, not and... necessarily a stupid person, but someone who is accustomed to heavy, heavy labor. Sure, like, I'm uh, being a bit of a, a chop, bit of an ass, but chopping yeah. wood. Sure. Um, the, the classic, uh, the classic farm boy thing. You have to go out and plow a field and see the heavy clumps that are left over. The clods, for, for yeah. people, The clods, exactly. Yeah. That's why, you know, big heavy work shoes are called clod hoppers. Mm. Uh, but they'd take a mallet and go out in the field and literally smash them like you were yeah. splitting wood. Um, that was a common agriculture thing. And, and so is cutting wood with an ax. Well, if you pick up a sharp sword and treat it like that, you're going to do a peasant strike because you're overly committed to the blow. Oh, I missed. That. So the the Opi di Viano is more about letting um, uh, a bumpkin, if you will, uh, mm. do his thing because that's all he knows how to to use. He hasn't got subtlety, and he hasn't got art. So by encouraging him to do this and sidestepping it mm. with a pivot on mm. the uh, forward foot. Mm you gain a massive advantage. The, the Copa de Viano isn't yeah. so much about a bind at the center as it is about deceiving someone into doing what they're absolutely committed to do anyways. Right, right. Like but give, yeah, them, for, give them no, no for, for, I, for sure. You, you don't, you don't really, you don't really want to take it on your sword in the middle. You want right, to take it right. on your weak that's because right. that way it'll flow through. That's right. But uh, my, my, uh, my point just was that, you know, with this, because this action is so large by nature, you can, you, there's a little, there's a little play here. You could receive it maybe towards the middle and still have it work and still cut to the other side. Right. But the reason why you can do that here, you can, the reason why there's, there's room for mistake and the optimum is exactly right. Cal, I agree is of receiving it on the week uh, in frontale, but we'll talk about that when we get to it. Um, but you can get away with some late covers here because the nature of the action is so large. But my point is, is that this action is unique, right? It's 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 unique. It's not the no, it's not the norm, right? These no, su no, these no. super large large uh, tempo actions are not the norm over in conventional exactly over commitment. They're not over the norm in conventional swordsmanship, right? Um, yeah. So, uh, so cutting around to the other side is not something that you can do in a normal situation. And he's not going to talk about it. Um, I don't believe he talks about it in the, in the third master. Uh, that's correct. So he doesn't talk about it in the third master. He only talks about it here. Um, and, and I'm also kind of laboring this point a bit because this actually, this is a point that really flies in the face of a lot of what we see at Emma. We see a lot of going around to the other side from low crossings at the middle. And, you know, I don't think that's because we don't understand it or whatever. I just think that that's because we often don't concentrate on where that engagement is as much as perhaps we should. And as it happens, Fiore outlines the, the section of cuts, about cuts in the Largo section. He classifies it by the point of engagement, engagement at the weak or engagement at the middle. So all that is to say, it seems to be a critical 
thing that we need to pay attention to, even when we're on the floor uh, engaged in, in fencing, right? That's something that we have to learn to pay, to pay attention to. So, um, great. Okay, so now we've characterized these, these three plays. We're still going to go through them, but um, that was a whole lot of context, right, that we wanted to set out before we start rolling through them. Any questions? Uh, any other questions about that? Anybody still awake? No. <laughs> they're all they're, they're all poli they're all politely muted. Um all right. All right. So uh yeah, so so let's, just to let's join hands and contact the living. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so just to um re a reprise, right? This is the first master um uh of, of Largo. In this first master, the conventional M interpretation is that there are three possible results. The a defender responds with a single time remedy attempt which if the attacker does nothing will kill them in response to this remedy the attacker turns their edge in and abandons their attack and once they've turned their edge in to create a bind depending on the nature of that bind the um the master can there uh, can then either cut around to the other side or do this so let's move on to this guy the first scholar okay 25 R D. Uh, all the way back at the top, Alex, would you like to read this one for us? I have given you a thrust of the face as the master before me had said. I could have also performed the other action he mentioned. Just after crossing swords to the right, I could attack by turning up and dent out on the left side of the opponent's head and arms, just as my master before me has said. Awesome. Thank you, Alex. So again, um, we have textual proof that this is not a uh, separate play from the master before. He's following on to uh, clarify more what he said. So he says, I've given you to a thrust of the face as the master before me had said. So this is, the, this is one of those options. And he says again, just to repeat himself, I could have also performed the other thing, which he's not going to show, but he's now mentioning twice, attack right after the crossing um i.e turn a fendente to the left side to the head and arms of the opponent as my uh, the master before me has said okay so again we already covered it but here is one of two things the other thing being uh, coming across to the other side okay any questions no all right great so let's move on to the next the next master. So before we read this guy, I want to take a, a quick pause to refresh our memories about the master scholar system. So when I said that uh, the sword section is um, more, um, it's not as well organized, it's not as obviously organized as the dagger section, um, this is where we're going to start to see it. So Fury's rules are this, there's a crown a master, and then every garter after the crown master is a student of that master. And then every crown and garter following a crowned master is a counter to this master, right? Them's the rules. So here we have a crown and here we have a garter and here we have another crown. And actually at the end of the, um, well, not the end of the strato section, we're gonna get the crown. Um, and we're not, it's, it's not gonna be till the end of the, of Largo where we're gonna get our first counter master. But anyways, so crown and garter, then another crown, and then all the other plays. So by conventional or mm, mm, by a literal interpretation of Fiore's organizational structure, every scholar, every gartered man after this second master should be a student of this master. Now, uh, you know, on closer analysis, I submit to you that this may not make a lot of sense, de depending on what play we're talking about, specifically when we move into the thrusts. But, I mean, you could make it work. Um, but uh, um, it's not obvious, my, my point is that it's not obvious how this sword section is obeying this um, scholar, garter, counter system that Fiori has hitherto more or less stuck to fine, which is an interesting thing. Um, for us to, to, to note. Also note that it doesn't, um, 
at least the last time I read the scholarship, it doesn't seem like crowns and garters here were added on after or added frivolously, unlike in the Paris, where they're just someone vomited crowns and garters on the page. Um, so Willy nilly. Yeah. So it's it's likely that all the crowns and garters here are original. They're placed on purpose. So anyway, um, but that's that's more of an academic thing that we can uh, we'll talk about later. So second master, folio 25 VA. Let's do it. Uh, oh, did it, did you already read the text, Alex? No, you didn't. Oh, no, you read the previous one. Uh, Andrew. Is this too small? Sorry. Can you uh, see it there, Andrew? Oh, I think you're muted there somehow. Yeah, I can't hear you. How about this? Oh, there it is. Yep. Ah, uh, yeah. My microphone was gone <laughs> out of the way. Yeah. Okay, here we are also crossed in wide play, but at the middle of a sword. As soon as the cross is made, I let my sword glide over the opponent's hands. If I pass off line with my right foot, I can push a thrust to his chest, as you will see pictured right after this. All right. Thank you, Andrew. So <clears throat> here's the crossing at the middle. And he says... As soon as the cross is made, I let my sword glide over the opponent's hands. If I pass off line with my right foot, I can push the thrust to his chest, as you will see pictured right after this. Okay. And let's let's read that one as well. Because it's more or less the same one. Um, Andrew, you want to give us this one too? So this is 25 VB here. Okay. I have completed the play of my master by performing the parry and immediately doing what he said. First, I wounded the opponent in the arms. Then, I placed a thrust into his chest. Awesome. Okay. Great. So, here's the master here, crossing at the middle. And when he crosses at the middle, he says... As soon as the cross is made, I glide with my blade over his hands. And if I pass with the right foot out of line, I can push the thrust of the opponent's chest. Okay? And then he shows it. Okay? So, again, it's important that we don't read this as having a static tempo. Okay? Um... I certainly read this as following on from the master, from our this tempo logic that we just built. So you go for the, the single time remedy, and um, if you get a low crossing, then rather than having two options available, either to press the right side or cut around to the left, you only have one, which is to press the right side if it's available. Right? This he's not talking about here what you might do if you were cross at the middle and the tempo was static. He's not talking about that context at all, right? He's talking about the context is just like this one. The master has arrived here. He's cross at the middle, but he's leading. So he can choose what to do. And he says, if, you know, um, as soon as I, I make this crossing, I can slide to the hands and push a thrust to the chest. Now, you might say, yes, but what if he were to push across the center, right, and exclude that action? And the answer is, well, then he is, he's excluded it, right? Obviously, again, this is not something that you can just decide to do, regardless of what, he, of what the enemy does, right? Just like over here, if he excluded the side, if he pushed across the center, then you had something else to do. In this case, it was to cut to the other side. Here, if he doesn't exclude the center, then great. He gave you the same thing that you that you saw just before. And isn't that interesting and isn't that cool, right? So we're still doing things we know. If he does push Aaron. across the center, then there's other things. Aaron, mm -hmm. this, this, this may muddy the water from your perspective, how mm -hmm. you're presenting this, but I'd like to 
offer something for the sure. students if they're doing readings in, in the greater community mm -hmm. they will find an argument for the second master of Joko Largo mm -hmm. making a false edge cover in 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 this particular thing. now can you uh, enlarge that mm -hmm. plate absolutely you enlarge that plate and folk try to focus on the the master's hand position his right hand position okay ah. You see where his thumb is? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is this is the the basis of an argument that he's perhaps cut up from, say, full iron gate or something like that. But the false edge cover here puts his blade behind the Zugadori's Zugad mm -hmm. blade, and with a simple turn as he steps forward, he can place it across the arm and into the chest very easily because he's leaving the space that the Zugadori is trying to cut into. And that's mm. this business about, you know, making a, a step to the outside. Mm. It's a critical play, a mm. critical piece of footwork in all of the Jaco Largo plays is mm. the ability to step to the outside. Mm -hmm. So for the student's sake, mm. I'd like to point out that there are uh, fair arguments mm -hmm. for either thing. In, in this hand position, you can't be certain that he's uh, using his true edge to make the cover, sure. he could be using his false edge. And I've played it out, and quite frankly, it works just as well. Mm -hmm. Because um, when you've cut up to uh, Fenestra against this blade, you've excluded it. And so when you take your passing step off the line, mm -hmm. dropping the sword onto the left hand of the Zugadori and thrusting mm -hmm. to the chest, it's, it's an open highway. So mm -hmm. anyway, I wanted to point that out. Um, it may not be where you were going with this. No, I no. Don't think it muddy, I don't think it muddies the waters. It just gives um, better context for a lot of online arguments about this kind of stuff. Yeah, and, and quite the contrary, Cal. I actually think it focuses it because I, I, I don't want people um, coming away from our treatment of this subject here today to believe specifically with respect to the place here, I don't want them to believe that it's important that we we interpret the first play as coming from a fendente. Or or, right. or this play is coming from a fendente, right? Obviously swords can engage from all sorts of different cuts and posters. Right? So, you know, uh, what's what's more important for us to understand to take away, I would say, from studying this stuff is the concepts involved with action, counteraction, leader, follower, etc., rather than the strict interpretation of, well, we're saying this comes from a fundente, we're saying this comes from whatever, right? Um, exactly. So, and, 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 and so too with this master, right? Whether it's from a fundente or not, it's not the point. Um, the point is, yeah. is what what's the tempo situation uh, on the crossing, and what what can you do, right? What's the what's the center? Uh, what's the position in the middle? Can you who has the initiative? Exactly, exactly, exactly. And, and you know, and again, because this is swordsmanship, if this guy were to, you know, if one of these guys were to pause, right? If you know someone who's taken the initiative and 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 given it away, right, and not used it can totally fork it back over to the other person, right? So, you know, none of these actions that take the initiative guarantee it in any in any way. It's just like with the dagger. If you don't use it, the enemy will take it back or yeah, they, they'll have it. an opportunity to take it back, right? Um, so, uh, so, right, this is Largo. This is all very fluid, uh, uh, active, um, full of motion uh, swordsmanship, okay? Uh, and yeah, thank you. That was that's a fantastic uh, point, Gail. And I and again, I've said this many times here. I I think it's important that um, as important as knowing you know what we think is the right interpretation of this or that, as important if not more so, is knowing all the other different views and how we got here, because that shows the complexity of the material. Right? You don't want to make the mistake to think that the material is simple and you've got the right view. Right? That's how you get. Um, hour long, uh, uh, <laughs> hour long seminars and whether or not the thumb is pointing on nine o'clock or four o'clock on, you know, a certain folio or something ridiculous like that. Anyway, um, you don't want to do that. Okay. So great. So this is, this is good. This is the, we spent 
um, we got we we looked at the cuts, we looked at the preface today, and we spent our time contextualizing and understanding the first four plays of the Largo section, which has set the table for us to blow through the next set of plays in the next uh, session. Um, just as a bit of a taster, because I know we're nearing 10 o'clock, we're going to be looking at a couple of blade grabs, which are awesome. Blade grabs are amazing. We're going to be looking at a peasant strike and finish, um, which is something that, as we kind of teased before and Kel kind of said, it's a play to do against someone with um, immoderate control of their force. We have a leg void and a ball kick, which is fantastic. And then we have a bunch of responses to thrusts, counter thrusts in opposition, um, some uh, grappling that can be uh, that can result from uh, thrusts and also breaking of thrusts and some largo plays that can result from breaking of thrusts. And finally, at the end of the, uh, we have an elbow push here as well, uh, lest you forget that we, we left the elbow push behind in dagger. Well, here it is again. Um, we've got a really funky uh, uh, play from the breaking a point here, which is really, this is a party pleaser, this one. And then we end with a, <laughs> we end with a little uh, sword, and, um, uh, sword and two hands action here with a cool fall, uh, false point uh, play, which is really neat. So lots of awesome stuff to look forward to for next week. Um, and uh, broadly speaking, things that round out the kind of flavor at least in a certain sense, that Fiori is trying to give with the Largo section, right? You know, like I said before, there's as, there's way more that Fiori leaves out than what he puts in. But it would be a mistake to think that just because it's left out doesn't mean that it's not important or that um, it's not really here, right? So the stuff that Fiori shows is noteworthy because he's shown it, but all the other things that he leaves out and things uh, that we can see in other uh, swordsmanship manuals, um, you know, unless we have explicit reason to believe they're not in here, we can consider them probably in here somewhere. Whether or not they're Fiori's pre uh, preference is, a, is, a, is one thing, but um, yeah, swordsmanship is, is huge. It's vast. Um, okay, great. Um, any last questions or comments from anyone here? Let me go down the list of scholars and free scholars. So, uh, Andrew, do you have anything you'd like to add or subtract? Uh, no, not anything. No? Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, BD? Uh, two thoughts. One was first play of longsword and second play of longsword from the left side. Uh, I remember chatting with one friend, and, and he was baffled that we could do it from the left as well as the right. Um, huh. And again, from the conversation uh, about mm -hmm. coming up from the false edge, mm -hmm. I'm looking at the false edge deflection versus the downward true edge deflection would be an interesting topic for another day. Yeah, um, yeah, because the you know we, we make a big deal about the single time remedy from uh, from high from high posta at, at Emma, right? Um, you know these these fendentes that giving you these really clear single time remedies. But the false edge remedies that come from uh, below, or that often come from below, um, with um, really good footwork and excellent control, they can be pretty damn close to a single time remedy, right? We have this kind of cheat concept. I don't want to call it cheat because that's kind of pejorative, but um, okay, if we have a single time remedy and we have a double time remedy, then we could have a time and a half one, couldn't we? Right? You know, which if you press me for a definition, it would be a double time remedy that happens very quickly. Right, so you could have a parry repose that's two full actions that take takes two full times, right? Bang, bang, right? But you could have a remedy against a blow that's like bang, bang, right? That's super quick, right? If it's done in a very trained and practiced way, and um, remedies from the false edge, uh, especially if they're picture perfect, right? If you get a good deflection, right? They can be damn fast. And it's possibly not useful to, you know, argue which one is faster, these Fendente ones, you know, or, or the Sotani ones. So all that is to say that I really think that thinking about these engagements from the other guards, from lower guards, as well as from other blows is really useful, right? That's a really important thing to do and uh, not to forget about, right? 
these single time uh, remedies don't only come from Fundentes from Ladonna. Right. Um, so that's a, that's a great that's a great point, Beauty. And it, thanks again, Kel, for bringing that up. Um, and then I, I think it's uh, yeah, Kel. Last but not least, do you have anything else you want to add or subtract? Hmm. No, no. I, I think I put in my two cents. Sweet. Awesome. Well, the man that uh, time sure flew by. It is ten o'clock. Um, if nobody has anything else, then. Uh, yeah, we've formally entered the Largo section. Um, I had a fantastic time tonight. I hope you guys did too. Hope you find it useful. And we will see you all next week on Monday. Ta-ta. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks, Aaron. Have a good night. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. Good night. Good night. All right, good night.